I found a sweet haven of sunshine at last Jesus abiding above His dear arms around me are lovingly cast And sweetly he tells of his love Kind of recap a little bit of what we talked about last week and then um, dive into some things this, this, uh, this morning. To recap what we talked about last week, 1 uh, Thessalonians 5.18 is where we were. And uh, it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And we looked at it from the aspect of uh, in difficult circumstances, we can still be thankful in them. We're not necessarily thankful for them. That the bad thing had happened, but it happened, and God can use it. And we talked about three things that we can do to be thankful in those difficult circumstances. One is having a complete trust in Christ, knowing that God sees the big picture that you and I don't, which led to number two, knowing that God loves you. God, at the end of the day, has your best interest in mind, even though you may not think so. God looks at our lives not through a temporary 70 or 80 years. He looks at them through eternity, okay? And so you don't always get to see the big picture. And I don't always get to see the big picture. That's where faith comes in, and you trust the one who does see the big picture. And then finally, we talked about last week how God can use our difficulty and make good come out of it. We gave several different examples. I don't want to belabor the point, but Romans 8.28 tells us, that God can uh, use all things for good to them that love him and are called according to his purpose. God can do absolutely anything. And I've got to believe that and I've got to trust that. Because he's never failed anybody. Never lied to anybody. He's not going to start now. So uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of take it a step further. And uh, just kind of look, look like um, or ask what does giving thanks unto God actually look like in, in our day-to-day -day life. So... Um, we're going to be diving into a lot of different passages. This uh, won't be as expository. We're not seeing it in just one passage uh, today. Uh, we're going to be all over the place. Um, so I just want to kind of lay a little bit of a foundation here before I talk, to, talk about some of my points. Uh, one, just seeing that the importance of giving thanks unto God and how it's related uh, in Scripture. Look at Psalm 92. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, everything will be on the screen as well so you can follow along. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 11, and all the beasts stood around about the throne and the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever Amen. And we could look at literally just hundreds of scriptures talking about the importance of giving thanks unto our God. Not just as humans, we see even in angelic beings doing the same thing. Uh, David gave thanks, the Levites, Daniel, Asaph. I mean, we could go on and on and on, but the reality is it is important to be thankful unto your God. Because let's look at, think of the alternative of that. I mean, what do we think of someone who is, is generally unthankful? Someone who's generally unthankful, one, um, uh, they, they lack care and appreciation for those who actually bless them. We would say even take it a step further, they're prideful or selfish. Someone who's unthankful, we'd just classify them as one big brat, right? Like, seriously? Not thankful for anything or anyone? In, in Scripture, those who are unthankful are uh, related as evil or wicked, uh, Romans 121, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, where it's talking about the end times, where men will become ungrateful, unthankful, and so on and so forth. It's, it's related to, to evil. So the, the alternative of not giving thanks is being unthankful, and that is not uh, an attribute us as believers need to have. But the question remains, what does it look like in our daily lives to give thanks unto the Lord? I'm going to give you four things this morning. The first one's kind of obvious. It, it, it's to vocalize our, our thanksgiving unto God. Uh, a couple scriptures here. Psalm 35. I will give thanks. I, I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. Meaning, others know about your faith in God because you vocalize it. If you want to say thank you to the Lord, 
you, you don't just keep it inside. My, my brother Lucas always said, whatever is in the well always comes up in the bucket. And so if there is th a thankful heart there, you're going to vocalize that to those who are around you. Uh, Psalm 75, unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks. For that thy name is near, thy wondrous works declare. That we are to declare our thanks unto our Lord and unto our God. That we are grateful. You know, I want you to consider something for a second. None of us, none of us are here, first of all, by an accident. And the, the reason you exist is because God Almighty wants you to exist. You think about this. God, God formed Brent Cunningham. My soul, my person, everything about me, God formed it. I am not here without him. As he looks into the future, years ago, he knows that he will one day create a human being named Brent Cunningham. So first of all, if you don't think you're significant or, or special, all of us are special to God. We're unique because we're made in his image. And if you want to thank God for anything when you wake up in the morning, Lord, I'm here. He granted you a new day. You know God didn't have to give you this day. He doesn't owe you or me anything. Take a deep breath. Everybody take a deep breath. One, two, three. If he doesn't want to give us the next one, he doesn't have to. He owes me nothing. He is the creator, and I am the creation. So I vocalize my thanksgiving unto the Lord. But I don't think God just wants lip service. Yes, he wants us to, to vocalize it, but that's not all he wants us to do. So what does thanksgiving look like in our lives? I think it has more to do with what you do than what you say. This isn't on the screen, but if you want to write it down and check it out later, Colossians 3.17, it says, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to, the, to God and the Father by him. Whatever you're doing, what you say, or whatever you do, it is to give thanks unto our God. So how are you going to give thanks to the Lord? How am I going to give thanks to the Lord? I'm going to give you a, a couple other things that we can do. And we know to vocalize it, that's easy. But to show it, let me give you a couple things. First thing here in, in actually doing something to communicate thanksgiving to God is to be willing to sacrifice for him. Be willing to sacrifice for your God. Sacrifice is an act of giving up something valued for the sake of something else regarded as more important or worthy. The act of giving up something valued, meaning this is important to you, for the sake of something else that is more important to you. See, a lot of the reasons Christians don't sacrifice for the Lord is because possibly they don't value him as much as they value their comfort or the ease or, or whatever it is they're valuing. Our thanksgiving unto God is to sacrifice for him. Lord, what do you want me to give up? Or what steps do I need... Sacrifice isn't always necessarily giving something up as it is taking steps that are intimidating or scary. Lord, I'm going to do this for you. Psalm 107, it says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. <coughs> Hebrews 13, 15 puts both vocal and sacrifice together. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise unto, the God, unto God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks unto his name. Sacrifice by our praise and singing and declaring to mankind. And sacrifice of our, our money, our time, our effort, our talent. And God, you are worth this. It is worth inconveniencing myself. I want to communicate thanksgiving to God. I just don't give him lip service. I... I'm willing to sacrifice for him. Another one would be uh, having compassion on people. I want to give thanks unto God. You look at people the way he looks at people. This is what compassion is. Sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. When Jesus was preaching to the multitude, it says he was moved on them with compassion because they were a sheep having no shepherd. He had sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings, misfortunes of others. If I want to give thanks unto my God, 
I look at people the way that he looks at them. 1 Timothy chapter 2, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. Does it say all good men? No, all. Across the board. Excuse me, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who would have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. This knowledge of the truth in 2 Corinthians 9, it says it is an unspeakable gift. It is just absolutely marvelous. Salvation is what Paul is talking about. To have compassion on people. I think we're challenged with this, uh, especially today with uh, the Syrian refugee uh, issue going on. And I want to preface this real quick because I, I, don't, I don't preach on politics. Um, I was telling the early service, I, I've got better things to talk about behind the pulpit than politics. Not that you shouldn't be involved in politics, not that you shouldn't be an educated voter, not that the issues aren't important, but preaching about Obamacare is, it doesn't have place behind the pulpit. Like I said, I've got the word of God to preach. And sometimes political issues and scriptural issues, they come together and there has to be something, uh, something said. And so um, when, it, when it comes to this issue, um, uh, red state, blue state, uh, Republican or Democrat, first of all, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I don't like either of them, okay? I classify myself as, as an independent, so um, I just want you to know my heart as what I'm going to say here because it's important when we look at issues, we're looking at issues through our worldview, not through our political preference. Uh, decisions I make are, are, are made based upon the fact that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay? And so when I, I'm thinking about, uh, I was thinking about this, this message and, and having compassion and how to communicate thanks unto God is by looking at people the way that he looks at them. Um, he sees these Syrians... And, and think about it, Jesus died for them just as much as he died for everybody in this room, right? I mean, he's hanging on the cross, going through hell. He's doing it for Syrian refugees, too. Um, one of the, the things that, that made Jesus such a revolutionary was the stuff that he said. He said, you love other people as yourself. He said to love your enemies. So, well, Brent, I... He would say him, but what if there's a terrorist among them? And again, I, I, I'm not pointing out, I'm not saying how many should be or shouldn't be coming over here. That's, that's up to the government. The government, the House just passed a bill making uh, the background checks a lot more strict, which that's good. That you should do that, right, to, to make sure that, that we are safe. But, but let's, let's ask those questions. The what ifs. What if uh, among those 10,000, and then and kind of the viewpoint I'm taking here is, 10,000 are coming, and how do we respond as believers if there are terrorists uh, among them? I mean, we're trying to look at people with compassion. Look at them as Jesus looked at them. Uh, we need to consider some of the things that, that Jesus said. One, he, he told his disciples, I send you forth as sheep among what? Wolves. Does that sound safe to you? No. I send you forth as sheep among wolves. You see, what we're starting to experience here in, in great, uh, our great country in America is what Christians in the Middle East have dealt with for centuries. The risk of following Jesus. There's risk involved. And I would, I would go a step further. What are we afraid of? At the end of the day, what are you so scared about? Let me quote, let's look at Matthew. Let's talk about what, what Jesus says here. We'll skip down to verse 28. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body and hell. Jesus says in verse 28, you don't, you don't be afraid of those who can kill your body. Did you know God knows when I'm going to die? A terrorist does not have the final say of when Brent Cunningham dies, though they may pull the trigger. God does not want me on this earth the one who, who brought me life, brought me into this world, knows when I will be leaving this world. 
And I don't live for this world. I'm living for eternity. So what do I have to be scared about? God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What are you so afraid of? As I mentioned in face, uh, on Facebook a while back, um, maybe because none of us signed up to be missionaries to the Middle East, God is sending the Middle East to us. Do you ever think about that? God's ways are not our ways. What if this is how he's going to evangelize Syria in the decades to come? What if 10,000 people come over here, let's say 10% of them start following Jesus because they're in America, the land of the free and the home of the brave where we can preach the gospel, and let's say they get saved and decide to go back to their home. And they can reach people in ways that we couldn't over there. Couldn't they? They know the culture. They know everything about it. Is that possible? Of course it's possible. Can't say that it's not. What are we so afraid of? I'm not saying don't defend yourself. I was telling the early service, there are more guns in this little church than there probably are in most big churches. <laughs> I'm dead serious. They have a lot of concealed carry folks. They ask permission, and I welcome your guns. That's fine. Take care of your family. If you break into my home, I will shoot you and kill you. I will. Jesus said those who don't take care of their family are worse than an infidel. If it's my family or you, you lose. And if you think, well, Brent, you're wrong, well, we can take it up in heaven and talk about it then, but I'm not going to, I'm going to protect my family. So I'm not saying we, we don't protect ourselves, we don't take proper precautions to defend ourselves, but at the end of the day, could there be some terrorists coming over? There could be, there could not be. I'm called to have compassion, to look at those folks who Jesus died for just as much as he died for me, and share the love of Christ with them. And think about it this way. As Christians, we belong to Christ. We are bought with a price. He owns me. He gets to call the shots. If more people are reached in my death than they would be through my life, doesn't God get to call that shot? Doesn't he? I'm not living for the 70 or 80 years down here on earth. If I was, then yeah, it would be a most miserable situation and I would not be saying the things that I am saying. But if my life belongs to God, and it does, when I die, that is no surprise to him. And in that, I take great comfort. And in that, I'm not afraid. So let them come. Take proper precautions. Government's supposed to do what government's supposed to do. And let's share the love of Christ with them. Because I guarantee you, most of them don't know. So if we want to give thanks unto our Lord, vocalize it, sacrifice for him, but show compassion. You know, two months ago, everybody was asking how we can help them. How we can help these refugees. You want to know how? Two months ago, there was a picture of a little boy by the name of Aylan Curdy. Google his name. And you'll see a picture of a little boy in blue shorts and a red shirt, three years old, laying face down on a beach because he drowned trying to escape Syria. And everyone was asking the question, what can we do to help them? Because you know what I, I see when I see a three-year-old boy laying face down in the sand? I see my son. My son is three years old. And I'm, am I going to let some terrorist keep me from trying to help someone? No. Don't let your politics mess up the mission that you're on. Two months ago, everybody's for it, and now we're not. I don't care what the politicians are saying. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. He trumps all of that. I'm going to be compassionate. Because my life is not for here. It is for eternity. I mean, just, just, I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. That in a few days, I'm going to be sitting with my family in the comfort of, um, of uh, not my home, but uh, uh, Dave's home. I think, Reverend, Thanksgiving at your house, right, Missy? Yeah. Good thing I asked. 
I'd have been showing up at the wrong house. But I was thinking about that. I'm going to be sitting in the comfort. My belly is going to be full. I'm going to be relaxed. Things are going to be fine. So how, how can I, as a Christian in America, when things are easy, look at those who are in dire situation and say, I'm not going to help you? As Christians, I don't think we, we are to do that. I love, uh, I was reading about one missionary. I think he was going to Fiji. I couldn't remember in the early service, and I don't remember now. But he, he had a missionary team, and they were going, and uh, they were on a ferry. And they know where they were going. The tribe they were trying to reach had cannibals. And the ferry captain said, you, you guys understand where I'm taking you. These people are savages. They're cannibals. I mean, they will kill you and eat you. He said, you are most likely going to die if I drop you off here. Do you really want me to do this? Because you're going to die. And the missionary said this. He said, Captain, we died before we ever stepped foot on this ferry. We died before we stepped foot here. That my wants, my desires are dead and alive to Christ. Look at Matthew 16. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? We're already dead. Dead to our wants, our desires, and alive to Christ. So I'm not afraid. In fact, we should probably be afraid for, for them. Most of these people don't know Christ. Most of our neighbors don't know Christ. If we're going to be fearful for anyone. It shouldn't be for ourselves as believers. It should be for those who are facing an eternity without God. That is terrifying. You want to give thanks to the Lord? Just don't give him lip service. Be willing to sacrifice for him. Be willing to be compassionate. Put yourself in the shoes of other individuals in their plight. And all this kind of comes down to the last one I'll mention here is you want to give thanks unto God, do it by loving others, loving him, loving others. You know in Acts chapter 9, I'm not going to have you turn there, but you can write it down. Paul gets saved. If you don't know who Paul is, his name was Saul. He was a Pharisee, and he would arrest Christians. A Pharisee was a lawyer. Let me preface that real quick. Um, a Jewish lawyer. And his job, he would arrest Christians. The very first martyr, Christian to die for their faith, they took his clothes off of him. His name was Stephen. You can read about it in Acts chapter 8. They take his clothes off, to him, off of him, and they lay him at the feet of this guy, Saul. He was there. He saw it happen. In fact, he encouraged it. You get to Acts chapter 9. This guy named Saul does something nobody thought. He starts following the same Jesus he was arresting people for. Starts following Christ. And in Acts chapter 9, the Jews try to kill Paul. He gets in a basket, they lower him over the wall, he's able to escape. I never had anybody try to kill me or want to kill me. My dad maybe once when I was like a teenager, but uh, deep down, I've never had such a threat. And look what Paul says about these people in Romans chapter 9. If we want to say thanks unto God, we are to see people as he sees them and to love them as God loves them. Take a look at Romans chapter 9. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Paul is saying basically what I'm about to tell you, I mean with absolutely everything that is in me. He said, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren and my kinsmen according to the flesh. What Paul is saying there, he said, if he could, 
if it meant him going to hell for his Jewish brothers and sisters to go to heaven, he said, I would do it. Did you catch that? He is in continual heaviness and sorrow of heart. He said, if I could be accursed from Christ so that they could know him, I would do it. The same people that tried to kill him. See, Paul is looking at the eternal perspective. Because he loves them deeply. When Christ says to love your neighbor, church, that means even if your neighbor is an atheist, even if your neighbor disagrees with you in politics, or, or if your neighbor... Uh, is, is gay, or if your neighbor is Muslim or, or Buddhist, love your neighbor as yourself. See, if I really want to give thanks to God, essentially what all this is boiling down to, I do what he says. I obey him. I'm not saying it's easy. But if we look at the big picture, and as we talk about Thanksgiving, as we are in this season, Thanksgiving should, should be more than just something we say. It should be a day-to-day -day of what am I doing to show God I am thankful for him. And at the end of the day, it's sacrifice for him. Have compassion. Love him and love others. You want to say thanks to God? Do that. It's not easy, but it's worth it. So I need you to ask yourself a question as we're about to pray here, is in what way, that I just mentioned, are you lacking when it comes to giving thanks to God? Is it compassion? Are you quick to condemn people? Say, yeah, get them all out of here. This is our country. I'm sure the Indians said the same thing too, but that's a different story, right? Are we lacking compassion? Are we lacking love? Putting ourselves in the, the shoes of other people? Or is it sacrifice? I'm not going to do that, Brent, because one, it's hard and it makes me uncomfortable. Well, carrying a cross up a hill and being crucified for all humanity was pretty hard too. So suck it up. Show some thanks unto the Lord. We are so, sometimes so entrenched in our American Christianity, which loves to be comfortable, doesn't love to do too much, doesn't want to do too little, want to make ourselves feel good. We've got to step out of our comfort zone and serve the Lord. Or maybe it's vocalizing your thanks unto God. Letting others people, other people know that God gets the credit for what's going on in my life. You see, the Lord is so quick to get blamed for the bad and so slow, slow to get any credit for the good, isn't he? People love to blame God when bad things happen, but when good things happen, well, I did that on my own. No, you didn't. If you, if you can't even draw your next breath without his help, then how do you think you're going to get an interview? Or, or, or good things are going to take. How, how is that possible? Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Everything I am, everything I have, anything that's good about me is because of God Almighty. And with that, I am incredibly indebted to him and need to give him thanks. Would you bow with me this morning? Found a sweet haven of sunshine at last Jesus abiding above His dear arms around me are lovingly cast And sweetly he tells of his love The tempest is sore I'm saved Gladness, when rapture is mine, the danger is the past. I'm anchored at last. I'm anchored in love divine. He saw me endangered and lovingly came to quiet my storm beaten soul. Sweet words he has spoken and bless his dear name. The bill is no longer old. The tempest is o'er. I'm 
seen forevermore. Oh, gladness, the rapture is mine. The danger is past. I'm anchored at last. I'm anchored in love divine. This love shall control me through life and in death. I trust till the end I'll praise him forever And with my last breath I'll sing of my soul's best friend The tempest is all I'm safe evermore oh, Gladness, the rapture is mine The day Rapture is mine, the day.